Hello and welcome to the Franchise Tag Podcast with me, your host, Freddie Hall. I'm joined once again by my ever faithful friends, Adam Martin, Andrew Manning, both of it here with me to chat all things NFL here on the Franchise Tag Podcast for the old fan, the new fan and the UK fan. Find us on social media, the Franchise Tag Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter with the handle at Franchise Tag UK. You can find us on iTunes Podcast and on Spotify and now on YouTube as well. We did our little video the other day, our first uh, first round draft reaction to it all. Thank you for all the views we've had so far. We've been getting a lot of views, 50 plus, which we're really happy about. And if you know, get friends subscribing, get fellow NFL fans subscribing, following us on social media, listening to the podcast, it really does mean the world to us. We do work very hard at this. So we're going to keep pushing on and working hard even more. If you don't have any of them platforms, though, or you want to find out more about the franchise tag, go to www.thefranchisetag.co.uk. Lots to talk about post-draft stuff today. Draft is all completed now and what a fun weekend it was. Now we are on the very long wait, the slow build till the start of the NFL season, which is September the 9th, <laughs> which will culminate in uh, Thursday, September 9th. That will be on uh, going into Friday morning. It will be Tampa Bay, the reigning Super Bowl champions against what could be uh, maybe the New York Giants, Andrew, or the New Orleans Saints, the Miami Dolphins, the Dallas Cowboys, the Chicago Bears, the Carolina Panthers, the Buffalo Bills, or the Atlanta Falcons. That is all the home teams they are playing in the 2021 season. So it could be any of them. We'll be finding that out on May the 12th when the schedule is being released for the NFL season. There is definitely some dates that I am eyeing up and uh, also maybe some fixtures we're eyeing up that could maybe be London games. We never know. We'll have to see on May the 12th when the schedule is released. We are going to be talking a lot about stuff during the draft, a little bit of draft topic and uh, some other bits and bobs as well. I mean, the latest news today is Alejandro Villanueva, former left tackle of the Pittsburgh Steelers, has signed with the Baltimore Ravens on a two-year $14 million deal with $8 million guaranteed. And also uh, the defensive tackle for the New York Jets, Quinnen Williams. He has had a small break in uh, in his foot, but he'll be sidelined with surgery uh, for eight to 10 weeks. So he should be healthy for training camp. I mean, if he gets surgery this week, he should be back for 19th of July. So it, the New York Jets are not going to miss out on Quinnen Williams. But we'll dive right into it. We're going to go right into it. We're going to talk about the story that surrounded the whole of the 2021 draft. And no, it wasn't Trevor Lawrence. No, it wasn't who was going in the draft or anything like that. Flicking through my pages here of notes, as you can see, it was all about Aaron Rodgers. The Aaron Rodgers, Adam's main guy, the Green Bay quarterback for so long. Aaron Rodgers, there is so much rumor about him wanting to leave the Green Bay Packers. This gossip, I feel, really dates back to the 2020 draft which is when the Green Bay Packers moved up to go and get quarterback Jordan Love, who, who it was crazy to all of his fans, NFL fans and Green Bay Packers fans at the time. And uh, in answer to this, is, is Aaron Rodgers had an incredible season last year. He said, I don't care if you drafted Jordan Love. I'm going to go out and show you why I am the Green Bay Packers quarterback. He was the MVP of the regular season. He had 372 completions, 4,299 yards, which was seventh in the NFL, 48 touchdowns, which was the number one in the NFL and five interceptions, which was joint 33rd. So low, low, low. I think he was joint with people like Joe Burrow, who didn't even play for half the season. The Packers then went on to go 13-3 in the season, winning the AFC North, then beat the LA Rams in the divisional round 32-18, to but then lost to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 31-26 to in the NFC Championship. Um, Brian Guntkunz, the GM for the Green Bay Packers, says he will not trade him. I will not trade Aaron Rodgers. And... Um, it's, it's been reported that Rodgers won't go back to Green Bay unless Brian Guntkunz, the GM, is fired. Uh, however, Guntkunz has refuted that and has said that's we haven't had a conversation about it. That hasn't happened. Um, the feeling around this team is that the team isn't committed to Rodgers. Therefore, Aaron Rodgers isn't committed to this team. That is a one avenue of thinking. Um we might as well start with our resident Green Bay fan about this issue. He will know more than me and Andrew, even though me and Andrew have teased and prodded and talked a lot about it as well with Adam. Um, so, <laughs> Adam, what what is going on over in Green Bay, Wisconsin? Um, I think personally, I think it's just it's they're both at loggerheads, and no, nothing's going to change that. Um, it's now reached a point where it. 
I think it it feels very very real that this is the beginning of the end now. Um, Rogers feels that he's been wronged in a lot of different ways. Um, there's a lot of talk about them not giving him enough weapons. There's talk about them picking Jordan Love. There was the whole thing that came out on um, Pat McAfee's show about Jake Kumaro, where you know AJ Hawk was talking about how it was just the fact that you know Rogers had come out and said that we you know I really like Kumaro. I want him to be you know a target for me. And the next day they released him. So I think there's lots of things like that. <clears throat> the one thing that I would say is that Green Bay have worked the same way for years. Um, you know, back, and you're talking like the 80s, 70s, even further back. They have a very simple method. And I think it's one that a lot of teams use. And we're kind of very much in the same situation as what Seattle is with Russell Wilson. The general manager picks the players, the coach plays the players and coaches them and the players play the game and that's the end of it. Mm. And so when it comes to having a say about who the players are on the team, I think they probably do listen to a certain extent, but whether they take much notice of the quarterback, no matter how good or impressive he's been over his career, and I think that's that's probably why they've ended up in this sort of situation. Um, like I say, I think it's going to be loggerheads all the way through the summer. I don't think anything is going to change. It's probably going to get a bit ugly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I suppose at the end of the day, Rogers can decide if he's going to play in the NFL, but he can't decide what team he's going to be playing for. So, you know, that's up to the Packers and they're saying they're not going to trade him, which I, I can kind of understand because it, it's not exactly a great look, is it? Trading away the MVP. Mm. So <laughs> I can understand where they're coming from. But the one thing I, I would say is that this kind of feels to me very similar to what happened with Carson Palmer. Mm. I, think, I think it's very much that kind of thing where he retired um, from the Bengals and then they traded him because basically he was retired and they didn't have a didn't have a choice and coincidentally it's the same agent so <laughs> it's entirely possible you know they they know what they're doing <laughs> so I think I think that's the thing that's that's probably going to end up happening with it and from a stance of uh, all three of us are in Pittsburgh Steelers fans group, New York Giants fan groups, Adam obviously and Green Bay Packer fan groups, UK fan groups, US fan groups, I suppose. What's the general feeling amongst the discussion boards, the posts, the, the comments underneath? I can imagine some are very um, conflicting with each other and a lot of uh, name calling, I can imagine, as much as we don't promote that at all. You know, we all want an NFL community. What is the general consensus and the feeling going around with the Green Bay Packer Nation? From the cheeseheads, the cheeseheads. Yeah. <laughs> From what I've seen, it, it's kind of it, it changed a little bit over the whole draft weekend. I think you're not going to find many Green Bay Packer fans who aren't going to love Aaron Rodgers, um, and they're going to want him to play. But the fact of the matter is, is I think he had a lot on his side, and then I think it was, I think it was Friday night. I'm not sure. But there was a report that came out that said he was threatening to retire. Yeah. And that was the one thing that kind of made a few people go, well, hang on a minute. He's just sort of holding the team to ransom now. Mm. So I think that was something that didn't go down very well. Um, but on the whole, I mean, yeah, they don't want him to go because he's the MVP. Why would you want him to go <laughs> sort of thing? But I, I think that because of the way that it is, like I say, nothing's really going to change. I think the one thing that I find that a lot of people think is they're just really, really fed up with this sort of media narrative that is constantly being dragged out that they, that Aaron Rodgers is not getting any support because it, it really is just, it's like, it's such lazy reporting. It's like, it's just not true. I mean, okay. They haven't, 
brought in a wide receiver in the first round since 2002. Mm. Your Steelers haven't done it since 2006. Yet, where's the constant reporting for Big Ben? Chase, Chase Claypool. Oh, no, he's second rounder. Round cool. Second rounder, yeah. No first rounders, yeah. Yeah, you're yeah, right. This is what I mean. It's like, it, it just keeps going. And it's not like we haven't drafted people. You know, there's been lots of mm. defensive tackles, lots of wide receivers. Resigned um, Aaron Jones this offseason. Yeah, exactly. So there's been lots in there. And then not only that, Devontae Adams was round two. Mm. He's pretty good. You know, he, he's not bad at the moment. <laughs> yeah. You guys had Antonio Brown. He was round six. I mean, it's like yeah. you don't have to do it. But the other thing is, is they, they've been in a position where they've consistently done pretty well over the last, like, 10, 12 years. They've never been, apart from maybe once or twice, they've never actually been in the bottom half of being able to pick a higher pick. Mm. So they haven't, they haven't had the number five pick to go out and get someone like Jamar Chase, mm. you know, so they would have to give away a lot in order to be able to do it. So again, it's like, it's just something that I think that that's really something that you're finding now. A lot of the fans are just fed up with constantly hearing the same narrative coming out when you have got all of these players and a lot of people at the moment are coming out saying that this draft has, has not been good because we haven't bought in, you know, high picked wide receivers. It's like we've got an offensive lineman in round two. We've got a wide receiver in round three. We then picked another two offensive linemen. It's not like they're not doing things. Mm. They bought back all the defenders. Yeah. You know, both the Smith brothers, that wasn't done just for a laugh. You know, they've kick the can down the road on the cap space problem so that they can have another go with Rogers. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the fans are fed up with that. Um, but really I think um, they're just kind of, you know, I mean, everyone wants it sorted as quickly as possible, but unfortunately I just don't think that's going to happen. The narrative you were saying about is that Aaron Rodgers never has any help and the defense is really bad. And I actually looked at the stats earlier and last year you had total yards, 6,224 total yards, which was fifth best in the NFL. You had 509 points scored. Um, that was first in the NFL. Uh, you had 6.3 yards per offensive play. So, and that was third in the NFL. And on the defensive side, defense says you had total yards uh, against you was 5,344, which was the 24 fewest. I should, I've probably done this wrong way around. 24 to, in this case is really good. Is it the, the yeah. top end if it was flipped around? But <laughs> yeah, 7,000 was there. That's down there. Uh, 369 points scored against, which was 20th. And eight, but 18 takeaways, which is 26th, which is bad. You know, not enough turnovers. But that's not bad. But no. that isn't bad. And now, Andrew, you, you, you might as well weigh in on this. We've not heard from you yet about all this. So what's your take from all this of a, an NFL fan from the outside looking in on this? It's starting to get a bit messy uh, for me and it's starting to cause a bit of a, a bit of a rift from the, the team. And uh, looking as a, a non-fan, I think something does need to be done about it because um, I think one of them needs to go. It, it, it either needs to be Brian Grudenkantz or... Aaron Rodgers, but I think it's got that messy now and it's only going to get messy that one needs to go. Mm. Uh, and I think when you look at it, you know, they drafted Jordan Love and I think he's the key to whether the player who, who should go. Because if you're going up in the draft to get a quarterback, surely you think he's good. And if you think he's good, let Rodgers go. Mm. You know, if he's produced the goods, if he's done, he's sat behind him for a year, he's looked good, you know, Get to, what, June the 1st where you can trade? Get to there, get rid of Rodgers, move the cap space to the dead cap over two years. Jordan loves the guy that you thought was fantastic, you know, supposed to be Mahomes-like, you know, put him in. He's going to go into a great team already. It's not <laughs> as if you haven't got a good team. It is a fantastic, it's a good defense. There's lots of weapons on that team. Uh, and if you are going to be protected as a rookie. If well. you are going to trade Rodgers, then, you know, you're going, can I have some first round picks? Can I have maybe a receiver? You know, you go, what, you're looking at Denver and Raiders are the two ones that are coming out going, can I have one of your receivers? You know, you strengthen your team. But if Jordan Love isn't the guy 
and he's not performed in training camps and he's not looked good, you know, playing it. Uh, we haven't seen any film on him. We haven't seen any tape. And he's not, and the, then the organisation are not happy with it. Then it's Gudenkunst has got to go and Rogers is right. You've got to get rid of him. Uh, he's made, he's, he's caused this rift by doing this. So um, that's my view on it. And I feel really, really sorry for Matt LaFleur because yeah. I think he, mm. I think he likes Rogers and uh, he's just been caught in the middle of it, which is such a shame. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my view on it. So um, yeah, if, if it was me and Jordan Love is the guy that we saw, at college, you know, then what have you got to lose by getting rid of Rogers? What is he, 37 now? Yeah. You know? Well, I, I, think, I, I feel sorry about Jordan Love for this, in all this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, even if, if, if you get rid of Rogers and you play Jordan Love for this year and he is half decent, even if he's half decent, what you're in a league with uh, Justin Fields, who's in his first year, that could struggle, you know, is with the Detroit Lions, which is a bit of a dumpster fire at the minute and and a Vikings team that's we're not sure what we're going to quite get out of it Kirk Cousins is he good enough you probably say Green Bay with Jordan Love with the weapons that you've got I, I say you probably still win that league and go to the playoffs anyway so you know what are you losing by getting rid of him well this yeah th- sorry I, I, before we, I before you the add- only the only issue with it is that they've bought it like I say they've bought everyone back and they've mm. sort of kicked the can down the road on because the, they were in a cap space problem, and then next year they're going to be in a bigger problem because of what they've done. So I think that's the that's the feeling why they probably they they would love Rogers to stay another year because and then it kind of it works out on the contracts in order to you know maybe trade him then. And I think that's it. If in from the team's point of view, that would be like the perfect scenario. And unfortunately, that's just not going to happen. Man. I think they've become, I do feel really sorry for Jordan Love in this whole scenario because he is the innocent bystander in all of this. Like he's getting a lot of the blame and we're his fault. He got traded, he got traded, you know, Packers traded up for him and they went and got him. And really, Andrew, you're completely right. We, we haven't, because the media weren't allowed at training for the whole last year. We haven't, we haven't seen any of him. We don't know what he's capable of. We don't even know his relationship with Aaron. We don't know his relationship with Matt Fleur, with the offense. We don't know anything. For all we know, him and Aaron were best pals on the training pitch every day every day you know and that he was learning off Aaron and Aaron was being a good mentor I don't know we, we just don't know maybe he was connecting with the wide receivers maybe he wasn't maybe he was overshot in throws maybe he wasn't looking as athletic we just don't know and in a way if they don't if they get rid of Guntkunz it's the pack of organization saying we don't trust Jordan Love therefore we've made a mistake going up and getting him but we just don't know. We don't know as fans. We don't know as, as a media outlet. We don't know. And if you do trade away Aaron Rodgers, that is you going, we we trust and Jordan Love. We've seen enough out of him and seen him in training and playing enough to go, we're confident he can take us to maybe not as good as Aaron, but if he can match what Aaron was doing in the exact same offense, in the exact same defense, then we're, then we're going to be comfortable with it. Now, all right, after June 1st, I know the cap completely changes with Aaron and you do save some money on it, but the cap is going to, it, the money is going to affect you in a way and it is going to not help in the future. But I mean, the, the Denver and, Oak, and uh, Las Vegas, sorry, not Oakland, um, are the rumoured team. Denver, the heaviest team. I mean, there was one reporter said today, three first round picks and Jerry Judy. If I'm a Packers fan, I'd take that. I'd definitely take that, especially if Denver... It, it, well, I, I, Aaron Rodgers in that Denver offense, I think, would do just fine. But that Denver defense isn't all that it was. Um, the Raiders, similarly, could do three first-round picks and what? Well, you could go Henry Ruggs, but Henry Ruggs, Henry Ruggs and Judy both came out the same thing. Maybe Denver could go with Cortland Sutton. Or they could give you one of their main cornerbacks. I don't know. Like on Denver, they could give you uh, the, the Fuller. They could give you maybe Ron Darby. I don't know, I don't know if Darby is that highly rated but I don't know, it's a very interesting time like, you, like Adam said it maybe Carson Palmer was the last person to do is Andrew in your history of watching the NFL do you have any sort of comparison of situation to this well it's I mean the Packers have got had issues with quarterbacks in the past you know they had the issue with Favre um, in, in a similar circumstance they they messed the relation up, relationship up with him he had a bit of beef <clears> with Rogers, you know, he ended up saying, you know, stuff it, I'll just retire. Um, they went with Rogers. He went, oh, actually, I'll come back. He traded and it was that mess. He ended up going to the Vikings just to sort of stick it to them. Mm. You know, it's, 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 
very similar if you think about it threatening retirement and going to arrival it's it's the packers have, have been here before this isn't new territory for them but is this the problem adam with the pack and all packers organization is what you were saying about the old school <laughs> systematic how the organization is ran is that the problem with this organization maybe not player and gm and coach and a team that you know we've seen this with Favre, we've seen this now happening with rogers we have seen it happen on other teams other teams that do maybe run in a old school fashion style away is this for green bay is we talk about people like the jets and the jaguars who organizationally are ran terribly the texans organizationally ran terribly just because the Packers are successful, does it, it, does, it doesn't mean that their organization is still not ran terribly, ran good. You know, it could be completely ran terribly. Is that maybe some of these issues in the Packers organization is that it is how the organization is being ran? It's just because the team's successful, but it provides a, a cloud in front of what could be going wrong behind the scenes. I suppose the thing is, is that the only way you can really determine whether it's been successful is on the field. Mm. You know, that that's kind of the ultimate measure at the end of the day. And obviously they've kind of provided a, cons- they're very consistent. You know, they're not necessarily the most successful, but they are very consistent and consistent at a very high level. So I think because of that, they're, they're always going to kind of get away with certain mm. things. Um. Look, they're, they're kind of like, the problem is, is it's a brand, isn't it? it it's like the Yankees. And, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. It, it's such a big franchise in American sports that they can kind of get away with stuff. But unfortunately, I think it, it's not like, I don't know, it's just, it's one of them things where it's almost like they do it this way and that's the end of it. Mm. There is no other way of, of doing anything and no matter how much you try and push it into the future or into the present it doesn't matter they're just not going to move this is what it is this is where you'll probably find a lot of people would come out and say well this is what happens when you don't have one sole owner you know it's, Mm. it's almost like having that sole owner almost like that jerry jones kind of figure who just has all that money and has that will, that desire to get another Super Bowl ring and will maybe do things like, I mean, we like last year, he when they drafted CD Lamb and we're all coming out going, well, why do they need another wide receiver? They've already got like Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup. You don't need it. So, but that would never happen at Green Bay. Mm. See, Green Green Bay drafts for need, whereas for... The others, some of the others, they kind of draft for the sort of like, we're going to get the star player in because then that will tip us over or hopefully tip us over the edge. Yeah. I think that's all it is. It, it's it's never going to change. It's just what they are. Hmm. And um, I think it works until a player pot- almost potentially gets so big in that organisation that they feel that they have the ability to come out and say no i want to say in this now and then they go well no and and that's kind of the end of it and that's that's where it all sort of starts falling apart without the without the murky waters of the deshaun watson case and stuff that's going on with him the it's comparable it is so similar what is going on for both of them the only thing is i would say is the texans have been have been awful yeah. whereas the packers have actually been successful on the field yeah. but actually what they want and what they're trying to achieve, both of them, is very similar. is is very very similar. They don't fit, both don't feel like they get help. They both feel like the organisations run wrong. They don't both feel that they don't get things ran by them that they should have influence on. Whether that be draft, whether that be free agency, whether that be coaches coming in, and yeah, it, it it's very very similar. And I can imagine in a, you know next coming months, Deshaun Watson stuff's going to clear up a little bit more. We've got this Aaron Rodgers stuff. Um, I mean, I don't think Russell Wilson stuff is absolutely done with i think there's still some stuff in there going on there's still lots to happen with these quarterbacks and there's like i say it's very murky waters at the minute for a lot of these players and uh for these quarterbacks ultimately if if it does happen andrew it, it, it could be the raiders could be denver but who would you like to see aaron go to if it happened 
I mean, uh, can't say giants. Don't say the giants just because I know. Yeah, well, I have, I have seen, seen that. Them. I have seen. Yeah, that they have online. been talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really. Um, yeah. yeah. I was going to send it into the group. But I thought, come on, that's not well, going to happen. Could, you could send, <laughs> yeah, but you could. You've got two first round picks next year. You could send both your first round why, picks. Why next would year and why, we've got such a young team and we're building so well? Why would we want to go for a, a thirty eight year old quarterback? Just seems a bit silly uh, mm. and a bit backwards um, for the Giants. So, um, I, you know what? After seeing what people are saying, I would like him just to go to Denver so we can see that. Mahomes versus Rogers, uh, twice a year sort of thing mm. that's been going buzzing around social media a bit. That would be exciting, wouldn't it? So, um, more exciting than Rogers v. Goff, Rogers v. Cousins, Rogers v. Dalton. Then maybe Rogers v. Fields. So, yeah, that'd be interesting for a couple of years. I would like to see that. Uh, they'd both be two strong teams as well with those quarterbacks. So, that would be interesting. <laughs> Other than that, I, I would like to see him go to a rival. You know, it just makes a bit more drama, a bit more fun. Oh. Aaron Rodgers in Detroit Blue. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's uh, Adam's nightmare set up for the evening. <laughs> um, so, right, we, we've done Aaron Rodgers. We've done it to death. We understand what's going on. That. Let's go on back on to back on to draft stuff. Because lots have happened over the draft. We talked about our reaction video uh, that happened in round one. That's still on YouTube for you to go and see. Just half an hour video. Real good fun that was. And uh, we're going to talk. So we've seen a lot of draft grades. And I like. I don't mind watching them. But quite frankly, they're a bit dull. That we, we, we had an idea of, of doing the grading for each team. But it's long-winded. It's a bit hard. So we've just done winners and losers. We've not, we've very simple, a lot simpler than doing all the grades and going through each of the picks and things like that. But so we're going to we go back to the 2021 draft, even though it was just days ago. I mean, people still reacting to it. People still putting their 50p in about which teams did well, which teams did good. And and so have we, and, and we're going to do the same as well. But, you know, hopefully we have a bit more fun to it. So uh, we're going to talk about the winners and losers of the draft. So winner of the draft for you, Adam, who did you feel had a good draft night? Uh, so I kind of, I had two that I was a bit like, mm, don't know which ones to go for. Um, I, I actually think it was really difficult to lose in this draft. Like, personally, I felt it was quite... It was so filled. deep with talent. Yeah, yeah so all the way deep. down to the seventh, there were still, yeah. still names going. Yeah, especially, um, like, I, I kind of felt like in, with offensive tackle, there was a lot of deep talent in that. At corner, it was actually a little bit more than what I thought it was. Um, wide receiver is another one so there was quite a lot um, I really like what Cleveland did um, but the one that I've gone for in the end is Miami um, I just feel that they've brought in a lot of pieces to help Tua and they've they've done really well in showing how to build a team and right by constantly trading bringing in more picks <clears throat> I think it's really shown that with a gm like they have there how you can build a team very very quickly and and be a team that's going to be quite potentially very successful in the future i think jalen waddle is exactly the type of receiver that they need uh he's going to be quick he's going to be speedy that's everything that they need they're going to have parker on the other side so i think that's going to be great for them uh jalen phillips is uh, is another good defensive edge rusher, which, to be honest, I felt was probably their weakest point on their defence. I, I think he's someone who could be very, very good. I was a little surprised they went for Javon Holland at safety. I thought they probably needed a safety, but I was a bit surprised they went with him. But at the same time, I can kind of see why they've gone for him. Um, and then you've got a really good like NFL ready offensive tackle in Liam Eichenberg, who is just literally, he's versatile across the line and ready to go, um, which is exactly what Brian Flores wants. And um, they brought in Hunter Long as well, who is arguably the best blocking tight end there. Of course, again, Brian Flores coming from New England, uh, blocking tight ends were used a lot. So <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that you've, uh, I mean, they, they brought in a couple of others, but once you get to the sort of fifth, sixth round, it's the kind of lottery picks, really. Mm. So, yeah, I think they did really well. Already a good team and just getting better. Yeah. I, I think people forget 
like, because they picked like six, obviously they were third, then they were twelfth, then they were sixth. I think everyone forgets that was the Texans' pick, and actually their pick was all the way late down, and they are were really good last year, really impressive, and we're on the cusp of that playoff spot. And a lot of people, including me, believe that they were going to get it. Um, unfortunately, they did just miss out. But yeah, they've really strengthened over the draft. Uh, Andrew, who is your winner of the draft? Uh, my winner for the draft uh, was the Carolina Panthers. Um, hmm. You know, I, I did do the boring grade all the teams. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, it, it, like you say, it is boring. It is a bit weird. And there was just so many teams that just had the same grade, but it was so different. But the Panthers won when looking at the players they got and, uh, and, and going through it in a bit more detail. I thought it was so, so strong. Um, you know, the, uh, talk about a, a team that knows what they're doing, that... Uh, they've understood each round the value of a player. Because um, I was I was a bit unsure with the first round of JC Horn and thinking, oh, was that right? Was that right? But they, they understood the depth of this draft so well, round by round. Yeah. You know, th- by taking the best, whatever player they fell in love with, with the first pick, fantastic. Uh, they knew there was going to be offensive tackle on wide receivers with extreme talent in the next two rounds. And that is showcased by the fact they took uh, Terrace Marshall uh, Jr. With, in round two and then Brady Christensen, who's a player that you have really championed in the third. Mm. You know, And then not only that, as, as you go down, that I don't know whether one of their scouts had my notes or what have you, but you know, they were literally... <laughs> More likely had that rule for the college. Just taking coaches. players off of my board, though. Like, players <laughs> that I had really, really high... You know, they got Chubba Hubbard in the fourth round. I think that's an absolute steal. Mm. Uh, he's going to be a fantastic backup for uh, Christian McCaffrey. Like, what a duo that's going to be. That's going to be real dynamics. So that is an absolute steal. Then they took uh, Davion Nixon, who I had as the second best defensive tackle in the draft. And they got him in round five. I mean, you know, they also took late rounds. You're saying six didn't, you know, are they gambles? Are they not? You know, they took Shai Smith and Deontay Brown, a guard from Alabama. And that O-line was fantastic. Uh, and a slot receiver that in, his, in the senior bowl was probably one of the best players. You know, he looked fantastic. And I think I, I'm not sure whether I'm looking at this and going, you know, Matt Rule, Joe Brady, Phil Snow, you know, they've all come from a college background and they've all come recently from a college background. They come from Baylor and LSU. So they've seen all these players come up against them and, you know, play against them. And it, I think it's a really testament to, um, how good a knowledge they would have of these players and why their selection so good deep into this and their knowledge of it. You know, another one was uh, Urban Meyer. I thought he had a really, really good uh, draft as well. And it's another, it's another guy coming from college. So uh, yeah, I just think they, they, they selected very sensibly uh, and really understood the depth of the draft and got the best out of it with, um, with, with, with the amount of picks they had. I thought they, that they hit the nail on the head with all of them. That team, Carolina, is really ascending. I, I really like them. I, if they didn't, if they had Christian McCaffrey for a full year last year, I think they, they well obviously would have been a way better team. But everyone was like, "Oh no, Teddy Bridgewater can't take him anywhere." I thought Teddy did pretty well there, to be honest with you. I thought he was all right. Having Sam yeah. Darnold in now is going to be is going to be a lot better. And they have. And you're right with the JC Horn bit. We were all like, "Is that really what they need?" But then, yeah, when you look down the board, they went and they knew the depth and they got better picks for it. Um, my winner of the draft was a team that traded down initially from the 14 spot with the New York Jets, and that is the Minnesota Vikings. I thought going through it, they have really addressed everything they need, and they've done it really well. They traded down with, from 14 with the Jets and got two third round picks this year and gave up a fourth round pick uh, this year. Went down to the 23rd spot where they picked Christian Darasaw, who they probably would have picked with the 14th pick. They may have taken Elijah Very Tucker, I don't know, but everyone had mocked Christian Darasaw to go in and around there. If Rashawn Slater hadn't gone hadn't gone to the Chargers and we had gone earlier, probably Christian Darasaw would have gone there, maybe. <laughs> but I, I just think it's brilliant. I think they've worked the board really well. They didn't have a second round pick, but they had four third round, third round picks. And they picked Kellen Mond, the quarterback, Chas Surratt, the linebacker, uh, Wyatt Davis guard, Patrick Jones, the edge. All positions they needed to have a look at, all positions, all players that are more than capable and really good value as well. 
They got the great t- uh, tackle in Christian Darasaw. They got a really capable guard. Some people think he's the top guard coming out of the draft in White Davis. Chaz Surratt is a linebacker. They love their athletic linebackers like Eric Kendricks. He's not. He's more of a coverage linebacker, which they like. Um, Kellen Mond, all right, he's not going to start, but at least it keeps Kirk Cousins on his toes a little bit. He's someone that people have, have liked coming out of college. Not a first-round talent or a second-round talent maybe for some people, but a quarterback that is capable of doing stuff in the NFL. So I think that's good. I think that, you know, you might as well pick pick there. And Patrick Jones was a player that had shone at the uh, senior bowl and rose for a lot of draft rankings. I mean, he, in some people's mock drafts in the NFL world, he went in the first round. I thought that was a bit ambitious. Andrew, I am looking at you. You did go and have him in our alternative mock draft very high, but we did put you in the corner and in that position to do that. But I really love Patrick Jones. I have affinity towards him because he went to Pittsburgh. Um, obviously the uni, not the Steelers, but I, uh, I yeah, I really like that. And then, they pick some good depth players, three, uh, three, four round pick, fourth round picks, two fifth round picks, and a sixth. Uh, Amir Smith Marset's a wide receiver that people are really uh, hot on. You've got Cameron Bynum, cornerback. Uh, can he, uh, no, no, uh, no angry, no angry. There we go. Got that right. It was like we nearly had an Aziz Ojolari moment. There, didn't we? <laughs> um, uh, running back. Okay, I don't think they maybe need him, and maybe they drafted him a bit high. But got Zach Davidson in the fifth as well, tight end. I mean, they need a Carl Rudolph replacement. Obviously, Irv Smith Jr. is going to be starting, but I just think top to bottom, they, they've actually picked really clever, and they have not took maybe the shiny picks but the picks that will fit in that team. And they've, I, th- I think all these picks have made their roster a lot better already. Um, same for the Panthers and same with the uh, with the Miami Dolphins. All them picks, I think, are going to make these teams a lot better very quickly. Um, right, let's talk about the, uh, the losers of the draft. So, Andrew, who did you think had maybe a bit of a poor draft? We don't know what these players are going to be like for these teams. Let's put it out there, but these players could be very successful for their teams, but on the outside, looking at positions of, of maybe positional of where they took them. I mean, some of these guys maybe went and sip could be first round talent guys and people who went the first could never play again. You know, look at the Tennessee Titans last year. So who, who do you think was the loser of this draft? I mean, again, looking through it all and uh, my first thoughts was this team didn't do well. Uh, after seeing everyone else's grades, everyone's got them at like a, a, a B, and I'm, I'm baffled at why people don't think they were a loser in this. Um, and that's the Houston Texans. And I know I said to you guys earlier, it's going to be very easy to pick on them, and you know, should I? But when you really, really look into in deep of what they did in this draft and why, for me, it was a loss, uh, they took a quarterback in round three. Um, and, and, and they took a quarterback that's got notable knee injuries played only 13 games yes he's a great nfl size yes he has an absolutely fantastic arm but one thing you read everywhere about him is he's got a below average mobility we all know that doesn't work in the nfl anymore and when you look at the types of people that were still on the board at that time if they did want to take a quarterback you know Newman was still on there, who is, is, it fits the bill. Like we spoke about him, Adam spoke about him. He would fit that system a bit better when you've got a playbook that's designed for Deshaun Watson and possibly Tyrod Taylor. You know, looking at those playbooks, they don't suit uh, Davis uh, Mills. Uh, so that was a real shock for me. And also, you're probably going to be the worst team in the NFL this year. So you're probably going to get a round one first pick next year. So take the hit, play Tyrod Taylor. You know, if you like, go out and get Blake Bortles or Nick Mullins. They're both free agents. Put them in for a year. You know, next year you can get an absolute star quality. So I feel that was a wasted pick in round three. If anything, for me, you know, going into this draft as well, they had eight picks and they actually only took five players because they traded up to get players. You know, in a team that's in a rebuild and needs these college players and needs some names, you know, if anything, trade down and take some more picks for next year. But, you know, they, they, they with their next pick in round three, they traded up, they used three picks to go up 20 spaces to get a wide receiver that underachieved at college. He was a five-star, like, recruit and underachieved. Mm. You know, looking at the, we've all <clears throat> spoke, looking at the, the depth of the wide receivers in this draft. Did you really need to sacrifice two picks this year and a pick next year to move up to a wide receiver? 
is he going to impact them straight away? Is he one of those players? I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm not going to hit their round five Jordan, um, Reverend Jordan pick too much. I think he's, 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 they needed a tight end and he's probably the best they could get at that. Uh, but then they also went and did something equally as stupid again with the next pick, and that's waste four picks going up to get a linebacker, which I didn't have much notes about. Uh, and then doing a bit more research in him, found the biggest thing they could say about him was he had good work ethic. Um, <laughs> so, you know, fantastic for and him. That's but, what's going to change the Houston Texans a whole lot. <laughs> you know, of to, to, to waste four picks to go up and get a linebacker. Um, like I said, yeah. you, you need all the picks you can get. And when, and when you look at the players that were on the board when they took these guys, they missed out on like Jabril Cox, Baron Browning, you know, I think Aaron Robinson, the, the cornerback, which they need, was still on the board when they took these picks. Um, it, it, for me, it's, it's not, none of these players are going to be impact day one starters for this team. So... I felt like they've wasted their opportunity and they should have um, used all the picks they could use and get some, you know, hit and miss players, just, you know, get them all in, see who's good, see who's not. And then next year, when you know you're going to have a first round pick, you know, you're going to have a round two pick, go for it then and just take a hit on the year uh, and roll it with the youngsters that you got with, with, your, with your eight picks that you could have had. Yeah, it's, just, it's sad days in Houston getting even sadder. I, I agree. It's not so much they didn't have any picks. It's they just weren't wise with the picks that they had. Um, Adam, for you, who was the losers of the draft? Um, I do kind of agree with everything that Andrew said. I just kind of felt like we couldn't all say the same one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are now um, finally correlating our information, <laughs> so we don't do that. <laughs> Uh, I went with the Raiders because I love nothing more than giving the Raiders a bashing and <laughs> karma will probably come back to me and Aaron Rodgers will end up there, but that's not the point at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, I felt the Raiders just strange, very strange choices. Um, I think we both had Alex Leatherwood quite high um, as offensive tackle, but the way that the board fell, it felt like a really weird choice. Uh, Christian Darasol was still there. That to me is just bizarre as to why you would take Leatherwood there. So I I, lo I like Leatherwood. I think he's you know good offensive tackle, but it just felt like a bit of a reach uh, in that case. They then went and got uh, Trevor Morig, which you know we've all been saying for ages best safety in the draft. Uh, apparently the reason he dropped was that I think there was some injury concerns. He, I think he, did he have some sort of surgery or something that some of the teams weren't quite sure about. Um, and that was how come he dropped a few, you know, behind like Javon Holland and stuff like that. So you've brought in a really good safety. So what you then do is bring in another safety, um, <laughs> which is really weird because you've got Jonathan Abraham there. So you've mm. got two good safeties. So now you bring in another safety. It's a, a strange one. He played in the MAC. Uh, that was Malcolm Conce, I think his name was. He played against poor opposition in the MAC. Um, and it, it just felt a little bit weird. But then to really finish it off and make it just that even weirder thing, they then went and drafted a third safety in the next round in Divine Diblo. And you just sort of think to yourself, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing this? We, uh, before the draft and after free agency, we were all coming out going, they need O-line, they need D-line. You know, that was what they needed. I know they brought Leatherwood in and they did bring in a defensive tackle a little bit further later on in the draft. But it's just a really weird thing to then go and bring in three safeties. And it, it's just like, why? You know, why, why it is strange. It's it just strange. doesn't make any sense. And I think for that reason, <clears throat> you sort of think, you know, Gruden's in his fourth year now. Mayock's been there as well for that time. You do sort of start thinking to yourself, okay, well, if they're not going to get rid of Gruden because he's on such a long contract, you know, this is the second year in a row now that May Mayock brought in Henry Ruggs and it didn't really work. And now you sort of see this as a draft and you sort of start thinking to yourself, 
I can't see this working. It doesn't make any sense. And they still have holes. They've got loads of holes in their team. Mm. And you just sort of think it's a very weird thing to do. And that was why I picked them, really. <laughs> yeah, free safeties. That's uh, <laughs> And getting rid of how many offensive linemen is a really odd draft for the Raiders. Um, my losers of the draft is it's going to be an unpopular opinion, this one, because they're a good team. Um, but when I actually looked at their draft, I was like, uh, you've not really answered any questions that you have over your team and you've not filled the holes. And that was the Indianapolis Colts. I I don't think, I think what we're surrounded by is they took quitty pay with the 21st pick. And yeah, it was a really good pick. Like it was a really good pick. I don't, they do need an edge, but did they need an edge that much? Their biggest problem is left tackle. And they've not addressed it. They got Will Fry's the guard in the seventh. Uh, with the second pick, they put De- uh, got Deo uh, Aude Yingbo uh, at the defensive end. Uh, in the fourth, they got Kylan Grenson, tight end. They've already got two tight ends. I know they're older, Mo Ali Cox and uh, Jack Doyle, but they got Sean Davis, the safety in fifth. Mm, uh, he could, he's probably not going to start. The defense, the defense isn't a bad, isn't bad for the Colts. Um, Sam Ellinger in the sixth. You've got Jacob Eason behind Carson Wentz I don't really see nothing screams here to me like that these guys are going to be difference makers and uh, you know on the board was Christian Darris or Tevin Jenkins Liam Eikenberg when they took Quitty Pay and I'm not saying Quitty Pay wasn't a good pick I think it was but I don't think defensive line pressure was really a problem for the Colts last year that's what they were good at they were good at linebacking they were good at pressure on the quarterback and they were good in you could have Rocky Arsene, Kenny Moore, and um, Xavier Rhodes are the cor- main cornerbacks there. Xavier Rhodes is out of Renaissance there, so they could have easily taken a very good cornerback here. Or in the second, I, I just don't... None, none of these picks go to me that did, you didn't really need to pick them. Like, you didn't need to focus on them positions. And still, you haven't got left tackle. Now, there is rumour uh, that Quentin Nelson's going to play there, but then you need a left guard. And... I, I, there's no guard on here of Will Fry's going in the seventh that's going to be worthy of going there. I mean, a lot of Colts fans have gone, well, you know, if Orlando Brown was being traded, why didn't we have a look at it? And they, they really, should, they really should have probably because it was, it was a pick, it was a player out there that they really could have uh, done with uh, since the retirement of uh, Anthony Costanzo. Not a bad draft of players, maybe, but just not really taking plays that they needed. I just don't think Quee pays a good pick, but did you absolutely need him? I'm not sure. Um, I, yeah, I, I, it's not, but I, I really like the Colts as well. So it's why I feel, I mean, obviously the Colts are a good team. So people are like, well, I know the good teams obviously have good drafts, but good teams can have bad drafts as well. And they, they haven't had a good draft in my book. Yeah, it's, it's a strange one. Cause obviously like, um, you know, Quitty Pay is was a really sought after guy, um, but like you say, not necessarily the need that they desperately need. Mm. They were after. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe they just went for best player on the board at that point, and that's why they they've gone they, for. They him. could have shot the pick. To be fair, they might have shot the pick, and no one was nibbling for it. I, I just don't know. Andrew, obviously, your dad's a, a Colts fan, so I didn't know. Obviously, I have a very good relationship with uh, Trev. Your dad, shout out, big shout out to uh, Big Trev. Very. Uh, a listener always of the F tag. Um, what, what's his feeling about it all? Yeah, I mean, obviously I follow them a bit more than the other teams with my dad being a big fan as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I like the I like the Quee Pay pick. I've not got no issues with that. I do think that's, that's you know, they are strong on defence and that's a big, big, big help to them. I think he's going to be a, a day one starter for them. But then when you look at that, he's the only day one starter for them. Um, I think a lot's come. I think they've, um, Jim Irsay said that he's not going to move Quentin Nelson now um, and he's going to leave him at guard. Uh, and apparently he's chuffed a bit with um, was it Sam TV, Heavy. Uh, mm. I don't know if you want to pronounce his surname. They brought in free agency and they reckon that he's the answers to their left tackle. But for me um, and my dad, when you bring it in Carson Wentz as your quarterback, uh, you cannot risk him getting yeah. hit and sacked it, it was the one it was the number one thing that my dad said he was like well if he wasn't happy with that Carson Wentz being the pick but he went if we're gonna go for him that O-line needs to be solid and he needs to have time and then he'll do well 
because mm. uh, he says, if not, it's a failure. You know, another year down the drain, everyone's getting older again. Um, so, yeah, the, for them not to address even just depth at that O-line in case of injury, um, it, it seems a bit odd. Um, it's a good O-line. It just needs more depth, I think. Yeah. Uh, it does, it does, certainly for injury. And also, I, I don't think... I don't rate the wide receiving core. I don't think it's that great. I think there's some good players there. Michael Pittman, still unproven, but did look good down the stretch. T.Y. Hilton is older and hasn't looked as good in the last few years. Um, Paris Campbell was injured a lot of last year. Uh, Zach Pascal is is up and down. And, and they went for Mike Stra- uh, Strayan in the, uh, in the seventh. Uh, it could be Mike Strachan or Mike Strayan. Mike, obviously, Mike, the, the great Mike Strayan. But... Um, yeah, I just it just was not not right for me. Um, right, let's move on to maybe something that's a little bit different. Adam's going to be talking about the early look of the odds and stuff for the offense, the rookie offensive player of the year and the defensive rookie player of the year, and maybe a bit of who me and Andrew and Adam think might win the award as well. So, uh, Adam, take take it away, my friend. Yeah, so this is like mega mega early. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah, this is so early. <laughs> But basically, for the uh, offensive rookie of the year, you've got Trevor Lawrence, obviously favourite at two to one. <clears throat> Justin Fields is four to one. Zach Wilson at sixes. Uh, Mac Jones is seven. If you fancy Mac Jones as the, okay. the favourite, <clears throat> uh, Kyle Pitts is the first guy. You know, non-quarterback at uh, ten to one. Trey Lance is twelve. Uh, Chase is 14. Najee Harris for your Pittsburgh Steelers is 16 to 1. Uh, Devon Smith, 16. Travis Etienne's 18. And then it's 20 to 1 after that or bigger. So, mm. who'd you fancy? <laughs> I mean, I would love to say Najee Harris. Like, I would love to say that because I do think he is going to be spectacular for the Steelers. And I, 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 part of me is like, it's always a quarterback. It always seems to be a quarterback. But there, we were all talking at the end of that season, Justin Jefferson could be. It could. It was between the two Justins. It was Herbert or Jefferson. And it was 50-50 to a lot of people. For me, it was Herbert. I thought that Herbert has absolutely transformed that uh, franchise. But I can see why Justin Jefferson got it as well. So it wouldn't shock me if outside quarterback would get it. The only one situation wise who I think could have that bigger impact impact yards and touchdown wise because that's all it is really on the on this play of the years is the stats really I think and there is yeah. a bit of influence of how well they do with the team. <laughs> I, I think I think it'll be Jalen Waddle. I, I, I think I think out of the wide receivers, I just don't think Devontae Smith's in the right situation. I think he will get a lot of targets, but the <laughs> team's not good enough for him to be getting crazy amount of touchdowns or yards. I think Jamar Chase is fantastic and he's probably the best wide receiver, but there is so many other targets there. And then Jalen Waddle, yeah, Devontae Parker, yeah, Will Fuller, and they've got some other receivers there as well, but none of them can stay fit that much. They've got no running game. I, I think he could get a lot of touchdowns and a lot of yards if it's if it's not a quarterback. If it is a quarterback, it, it's, it, it's going to be Trevor Lawrence. If it's going to be any of them, I think... Uh, Justin Fields, I don't think will actually play the full season. I think it will start with Dalton. Um, I know it's the same situation for Justin Herbert, but I, I'm not sure the Chicago are where the Chargers were at as, as terms of a team. Um, Zach Wilson, I think it's rookie year, rookie coach. Um, but then again, rookie coach, we have Meyer and Trevor Lawrence, but is Trevor Lawrence the talent that he has? He could... He could really go all the way with that. If, if it's going to be outside of quarterback or outside of quarterback, if it's wide receiver, running back or tight end in Carl Pitts, it's got to be about yards and touchdowns. And for me, it'd be Jalen Waddle. What about you, Andrew? Um, yeah, I'm going to rule out all of the wide receivers uh, just based on it, the season that Justin Jefferson had. If you can't win it with those stats that he's putting out mm. it they're that not the problem they're there. not punting for wide receivers and i think um it's going to be very difficult for any of them in the teams they've gone to with the other wide receivers they've got to maybe get close to what justin jefferson achieved uh, i think they they might but it's going to be difficult and you know I, so i'm going to rule out all the wide receivers um then looking at it looking at you know quarterback is always the favorite to go for it i don't think any of the quarterbacks other than Lawrence, would probably have a shout. 
Um, I think Lawrence, Lawrence just needs to be competent, have a good completion percentage, you know, not do anything stupid, and he'll probably be in the running to win it just mm-hmm. off of that. We need Justin Herbert didn't win a lot of games. His stats were good. Uh, so um, Lawrence doesn't need to win a lot of games. He just needs to play like an NFL uh, quarterback and he'll be fine. I think um, Fields won't get enough game time this year. And I think Lance, again, won't get enough game time. And I, I think Wilson's going to struggle uh, for the first two years at the Jets. Um, you know, not, not to say he's going to be bad. I just think he'll struggle. So for me, looking at a position that is going to stand out it, it's got to be Kyle Pitts it's slightly different with the rook, with the offensive rookie of the year to the uh, offensive player of the year because you know I thought uh, Travis Kelsey deserved it last year I thought he was hands down and a, you know, a tight end can't win that for love no money but mm. as a rookie um, I think you're going to measure him as a tight end but he's going to have wide receiver figures and you're going to go wow that's better than any other tight ends ever done in their rookie year. He's got to get it. So for me, it, it, you know, with, with Matt Ryan throwing in the ball, how good that offense actually is, I think Carl Pitts, for me, is probably the favorite to win that. Yeah, I, I have to say the, the two that stood out for me was obviously Lawrence as the, as the quarterback, which, which is, you know, there's a reason he's the two to one favorite to, mm. to win it. Um, but the other one that did stand out for me was Pitts, just purely because you, you kind of feel like he's going to see a lot of the ball. You know, he's going to get a lot. And 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 you have to feel that... What's like, Pitts at again, sorry? Atlanta. No, what? No, oh, no Pitt, team, as in what? 10 to 1. <laughs> 10 to 1. Okay. Yeah. And you just kind of feel like that's like quite decent value. The only other one that maybe, and it, this is a complete pun, is if you went for Trey Lance, purely on the fact that he what look Garoppolo doesn't start, that he goes in, he looks amazing, and they go, we're sticking this bloke in straight away. Mm. There, there is that possibility, but it's a very small possibility, and you are taking quite a big risk on that. But to me, Pitts does seem like uh, if you want to if you want a bigger each way bet at ten to one, he's a decent price. So uh, when it comes to the defensive rookie of the year, this one's a little bit more interesting because they're kind of more evenly matched than what mm. they are. You kind of feel like with the offensive one, it's always the quarterback, whereas the defense is a little bit different. Uh, you've got Mika Parsons as the four to one favorite. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah Awusu Koromoa at seven to one. Quitty Pays nine to one. Jalen Phillips, Patrick Sertain and Caleb Farley are all 10 to 1. Aziz Ojolari is 13 to 1. Uh, Zavian Collins, 14. JC Horn, 15. And then it's 16 to 1 or more for anyone else. But if you want Gregory Russo, Andrew, just for you, if you want Gregory Russo, he is 22 to 1. He'll take that. I know he's like, he'll take that. He'll put a tenner on that. I know he will. Um, the big thing about defense will give you, again, stats-wise, is interceptions and sacks uh, or tackles for loss. So it's going to be a corner or an edge. <sighs> to pin one down... It's interesting I, you say I'm that. I'm not sure. The, the interesting thing you say about that, though, is that Meek Parsons and... Jeremiah Wusukoromaro, the two favourites of both lines. Which is strange. We, I'm I'm shocked about that. I think that's situation over every, anything. I mean, that's situation. I think him being at the Dallas Cowboys to people who want to bet, who don't actually have a clue about NFL, they see the name and think, oh, well, he's just going to be a good player because it's Dallas Cowboys. The Cleveland Browns, admittedly, but, you know, they are on the rise. I, I just don't, I don't see them both doing enough just yet. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. A bit weird with like Patrick Stern. There's so many other cornerbacks there. Does he get on the shoot? JC Horn is probably now a starter. Is he a uh, Caleb? Caleb Farley's a good point punt for the Titans. To be fair, that would be a good one to go for. I I don't think Jalen Phillips is bad for Miami either. They were a really good defense last year. He could really pressure and, and get some sacks there. I I'm gonna hear Andrews and then I might decide because <laughs> I'm a little bit undecided. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with uh, Fred about the linebackers. I think it's difficult for linebackers to really outshine uh, edge rushers and cornerbacks in this. I mean, I thought uh, Patrick Green was 
fantastic at the Ravens. And he, he didn't, didn't get a mention. Get, he, he didn't, didn't even get a mention, get a mention uh, really last year for it. So um, it is tough for those linebackers to really showcase, you know, stats wise <laughs> against the edge rushers, which is what they're going to go up against. Um, so for me, I've gone with the player that I think has gone to a team that is surrounded with players that is good enough. And they almost, almost, I reckon, took it last year. And I, I, I think JC Horn is a real good uh, shout at this and the odds because, you know, Jeremy Chin was definitely on everybody's lips for the defensive rookie of the year last year. And if he can produce the goods like he did in that backfield, that there's no reason why JC Horn can't as well so I think all he's going to need to do is you know have the interceptions there and and, and uh, his name will be in the mix for it I, I do think the other cornerbacks have got a bit more challenge with uh, the teams that they've gone to uh, whereas I feel yeah JC Horn it, 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 he's got a real good chance I think I think I think I'm gonna go Caleb Farley then I, I don't I really like the idea of, I, but then again like Jeremy Chin was safety last year slash linebacker Antoine Winfield was the guy that I was like in love with, still in love with. He's safety, but he got loads of interceptions. I think I think Caleb Farley at the Titans. I think that's a, an interesting one. They've got not nothing really at corner. They have Kevin Bayard at safety. They have another safety, but I can't remember his name now. But he he's day one starter. If he can stay healthy throughout the whole year, I I, I like the idea of him for sure. See, to me, I just feel it's all about sacks. I, I think yeah. Really- it's something that it, it has been a lot of the time. I mean, I know Aaron Donald is like this sort of like freak God, but the fact of the matter is, is it's because he's getting loads of sacks is the reason that he's winning it sort of thing. So to me, I feel like it's about sacks. And also I feel like it needs to be in a team that's doing well. I think that's another thing that you, mm. you, they have to like look like they're doing well in a really good team. And I think that helps. And so I think, you know, a team that's really going to push on is Miami. And someone like Jalen Phillips has got a really good shout at it. At 10 to 1, he's not bad. Quitty Pate, he's gone to Indianapolis. You know, they've got a really good defence. That's not a bad shout at 9 to 1. And I do think that Andrews Gregory Russo is... If you're talking sacks, he outsacks yeah. um, Jalen Phillips all day long. Yeah. So, you know, and he's at 22 to 1. Will and he start, re- though? You know, he's got some competition at the Bills yeah, on the edge. True, but mm, the, uh, the, by older blokes, though. Yeah, and the Bills' defence was not as good as what we all thought it was going to be last year. That's mm. why they brought him in. So, you know, I at 22 to 1, he's a massive price for it. But I have to say, I, I think the Colts have got an amazing defence, really strong. And someone like Quitty Pay, if he's going to get in there then he's he's going to see a lot of sacks. And I think nine to one is probably the one to go for. Well, like we always say on the Franchise Tag Podcast when we're talking about gambling, gamble responsibly, don't bet <laughs> what you don't have. Know when the fun stops, as the advert says. And uh, yeah, we can't guarantee you winning any money here. We're just pointing you in the right direction, giving our suggestion, having a bit of fun with it. So don't bet your, uh, don't bet your whole month's wages on quitty pay. But uh, you could earn a lot of money if you do do it, but don't, but don't do it on our recommendation. All betting odds come from what site, uh, Adam? Uh, it was vegasinsider.com. Vegasinsider.com. So there are more of them odds will come up out of on the hour regular betting apps uh, very soon into the season, I can imagine. But from us, thank you for listening and watching the Franchise Tag Podcast. I need to remember they am watching because we are on YouTube now. You can catch all our videos there. All our podcasts are on Apple Podcasts where you can leave a rating and a review. And we are on Spotify as well. But if you don't have any of them platforms, don't want any of them platforms, go to our website, www.thefranchisetag.co. Dot UK. We are on social media, the Franchise Tag Podcast on Facebook, on Instagram, and the Franchise Tag UK handle on Twitter as well. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Andrew, for joining me once again. And until next week, we'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you.